I enjoyed that paper enormously, and uh, I wanted to tie together, while we have the wonderful opportunity of Professor Havelock's presence, some other things that related him and Harold Innes. And the uh, one way of getting to it, of course, concerns the common interest which Professor Havelock and Innes shared in the impact of the printed word and the, and the phonetic alphabet on Western civilization. And I'm going to uh, make a few comments here. Professor Cornford uh, has an essay which Innes cites in his bias of communication, uh, the invention of space. And uh, the invention of space, uh, to anticipate a bit, concerns the separation of the visual faculty from the matrix of the human sensorium, the moment when the meaningless abstraction, the consonant, was invented. What Corn Cornford called space in his essay, The Invention of Space, a 1935 essay, what he called space was visual space. The Greeks long before and long after the invention of the alphabet lived typically in multi-sensuous acoustic space. Visual space was for them as great a novelty as Einsteinian space-time is for us. Typically, we still live in the Euclidean or visual space, that which the newly literate Greeks invented, a space that is continuous, connected, homogeneous, and static. Visual space is an artifact which exists only in countries that have phonetic literacy. In our own world, visual space is being phased out by the new environment of instantaneous, simultaneous electric information, which is acoustic in structure. That is why I have these two hemispheres here with us today. The world of visual space is in the left hemisphere, the sequential, continuous, connected one. The world of acoustic, primitive, third world space is in the right hemisphere. It's a world of the simultaneous, the holistic, and the world of gestalt and figure ground and pattern recognition. Innes, to anticipate some of the thoughts I'm going to present, Innes began solidly in the left hemisphere, and he moved steadily to the right hemisphere. He, his later phases are emphatically and strongly acoustic, pattern recognition, intuitive, and simultaneous. These are, the, these are the reasons for his incomprehensibility to left hemisphere people who found him quite easy in his early phases, say the history of the fur trade or the history of the cod fisheries or the CPR railway. In those phases of the hardware stage, of his career. Innes was a solid left hemisphere academic and a respectable man. He became, of course, the exact opposite. <laughs> now, this, uh, anyway, to go on for a wee bit further with this matter uh, that Professor Havelock has magnificently opened up for us in his work. Um, Professor Havelock is the first to have analyzed uh, the processes of abstraction by which phonetic letters make the magical transformation of the mind of the primitive man from an acoustic to a visual form. In his own words, he says, script was reduced to a gimmick. It had no intrinsic value in itself as a script, and in this marked it, this marked it off from all previous systems of scripting. It was characteristic of the alphabet that the names of the Greek letters borrowed from the Phoenicians for the first time became meaningless. Alpha, beta, gamma, 
constitutes simply a nursery chant designed to imprint the mechanical sounds of the letters by using what is now called the acrophonic principle. The basis of this abstraction in the phoneme, the irreducible meaningless bit of sound which is translated by a meaningless sign, the phoneme is the smallest sound unit of speech and it has no relation to concepts or semantic meanings. It is then a thing perceived on special fragmentary terms, a percept minus a concept. Whereas the syllabaries preserved a relation between percept and concept, e.g. pa, father, pa, p-a-w, with the phoneme, the two are split apart. This involved a split of inner imaginative and outer or verbal experience, the consonant, consonant does not exist in nature, only in thought. There is the further sundering of both the phoneme and the sign, the sign by virtue of their being made meaningless. But much more than the writer, it is the reader who assumes these dissociations as the basis of replaying and recognizing. And uh, quoting further from Professor Havelock, when therefore it came to transcribing a given oral statement, the signs involved through the abstract values attached to them produced a relatively clear, unambiguous, economical register of the exact sounds of what had been said. The reader therefore, and it is in the act of reading rather than writing, that the secret of the alphabet subsists, the reader of any transcription who had previously memorized the proper values could acquire automatic and rapid recognition of the Greek word for the act of read or the Greek word for the act of reading of what was being said. Those are just uh, scraps that I've, I've brought from, uh, mostly from, the work of Professor Havelock, his especially his recent work on the origins of Western literacy, which was published at OISE and of copies of which are outside in the hall for your use if you wish them. Uh, this huge event in Greek culture by which for the first time in human history, as far as I know, uh, people who were living entirely by ear became visually oriented and Euclidean in their awareness of space as a continuum. The Euclidean awareness of space as a continuum, infinitely extendable, infinitely divisible, this awareness is a human artifact, not a natural awareness such as you get from touch and taste and hearing, this visual awareness of space as a continuum was a product, a magical transformation of the phonetic alphabet acting upon the human sensorium. Now this same magic has been exerted wherever the phonetic alphabet has been introduced and with the same results. You develop a continuous, connected, rational activity on the part of people who are otherwise completely intuitive and acoustic. Now, in other words, you get a left hemisphere development in those parts of the world where you have phonetic lit literacy and you have ordinarily and otherwise only a left hemisphere, or rather only right hemisphere development, which is simultaneous and acoustic. The peculiarity of visual space is that it is lineal, and the peculiarity of simultaneous, instantaneous information is that it creates a sphere. We hear from 360 degrees, we do not see that way. The visual faculty, on the other hand, is the only faculty that is continuous and connected, connected. There is no such characteristics applying to any of the other senses. The alphabet, which 
Professor Havelock has superbly studied, it was the means by which the left hemisphere came into action for the first time in human history. It is now being phased out by electronic technology. The electronic world is simultaneous, instantaneous, spherical, and third, third world, intuitive and right hemisphere. The right hemisphere seems to be the normal and naturally dominant hemisphere of non-literate man. Only temporarily was it phased out by the rise of the alphabet technology. Now, Innes uh, was a very left hemisphere man in his academic, early academic period. He was a conventional, although brilliant, performer. But I think one can detect, even in his early work, his passionate concern with patterns. He was a man who was always looking for structures. His interest in the frontier was always a figure ground interest, not just frontier, but the way in which the frontier created a sort of cyclonic interface of two worlds, one rubbing against another. The Frontier is not, by definition, is a figure ground world. It is a figure that has a ground that is more civilized or more developed somewhere else. A frontier can exist inside consciousness at any point. You can have frontiers of speech. Today, the separatist movement in many parts of the world involves separatist linguistic movements in India. And separatism is a frontier phenomenon of cyclonic transformation. The problems of living on a border of the United States present Canadians with this frontier problem of transformation, of figure ground interface and abrasiveness. We have here today, we have the electronic equipment which is translating us into software instantaneously and enables us to be played back as software instantaneously. I, I would uh, point out, for example, that when you're on the telephone or on the air, you do not have a physical body. All you have is an abstract image. When you are not, I, when you do not have a physical body, as you do not on the air or on the phone, you are not the same person that you are when you have a physical body. This is a fig figure ground relationship which Innes never got around to studying. But it's typical of the sort of thing he loved to study. The, when you do not have a physical body, you do not have a private identity. And you have no relation to natural law. This just is an, an immediate consequence of being on the phone or on the air. When you have no relation to natural law, or that is, no, no physical being, uh, what happens to your identity? The identity of preliterate people is corporate, not private, and the identity of post-literate people like ourselves is moving in the same direction of corporate form. Private identity is phasing out very quickly, and corporate identity, group identity, is coming back very quickly. Now, that this huge revolution by which Western man acquired this amazing, transforming power of the alphabet to enable him to take over the control of the physical world in the way he did, uh, in a very devastating way, since he broke it to pieces, the left hemisphere man is a, is a specialist who fragments and breaks everything into bits. He is not a holistic man like the third, third world right hemisphere man. The third world man, the right hemisphere man, insists upon the holism, the to total gestalt, the total situation. He is not never a specialist. Whereas the left hemisphere man is devoted to specialism, 
These are themes, incidentally, of Innes's essays and, and writings, uh, and his de he deplored. That's why he deplored courses, surely. For, uh, he considered it an, a, a kind of intruding form of specialism which had no place in an academic milieu. But uh, I, I know that Professor uh, Havelock has a great deal that he can say, I hope he will say, on this subject, and we're also looking forward to his next paper. But please do comment on uh, anything you'd like to say about these hemispheres in their relation to the alphabet. I don't think, I know that there is a, I'm aware of the um, book uh, which first put forward this theory of the two hemispheres, but I, I've only read reviews of it. I've not read it. No, and, it's uh, not a, it's Professor uh, uh, Havelock, it is not a book. This is the work of a group of surgeons over the last few decades. Yes, but it has been brought out in... Um, Do, are I you thinking of Julian reviews, James? I read reviews of it. The last one I read was in the New Yorker, actually. Julian James, you mean the yeah. bicamel mind? I that is a bit of science fiction. Yes, uh, uh, it was, but it was based, this, upon, based this, upon this work. No, no, well, not based on, but just alluding to, really. Yeah. Anyway, I haven't, I'm not really acquainted enough with this to comment on it, but I'd like to offer a, a confirmatory comment upon what you said about Cornford's space. Um, and I'm very much in sympathy with your main distinction between what you call visual space and acoustic space. Although I suppose really what I preferred would be to assign the word space as a term to the visual, to the visual experience. But it, I've, um, I've never written a book as yet, at least, which would be called, perhaps, a preface to the pre-Socratics, who were philosophers who lived before Plato. Um, but if I did, and indeed I've published a little bit in one or two things in this field, I would, I would stress the fact that um, uh, if we judge the remains we have of them, meager as they are, by their ipsissima verba, they did not begin with a vocabulary of space, nor of matter, nor of motion. They are, their work as it progressed, shall I say their vocabularies as they progressed from uh, Xenophanes, the first on record, down to um, um, Zeno and Melissus and Anaxagoras, indicate that uh, they were trying to extrapolate from the, what uh, Marshall would call the acoustic experience, I call it the Homeric, um, extrapolate a new terminology which we recognize today as the fundamental common sense terminology by which we describe what we call the physical world. They had no term for the physical world. But you can see for example, the Greek word soma, which means body. And in the, in the right hemisphere there, would mean a corpse. Uh, that's what its Homeric meaning is. Being taken over and extended in its application by the earliest Greek thinkers in an abstract way to try and make it into a cosmic corpse or matter. And that is a very neat example of the transition from the concrete to the abstract, uh, which occurs in Greek philosophy. And um, Cornford did grasp the fact that the concept of physical space had to be invented. And it was a very remarkable step for him to take. It is interesting, by the way, that Innes in his, um, betrays in his footnotes that during the last years of his life, he had been voraciously reading in, um, the sec in what secondary sources he could find in antiquity. In and these are, he mentions Cornford, Rhys Carpenter, Milman Perry, and above all, Martin Nielsen, who put the story together of the, of the oral epic. These were precisely 
These were precisely the authors which in the same period I was devouring myself in parallel with him, but unknowing. Well, not to prolong matters too long, I'll, um, I'll get on with it. This portrait, as I proposed, of Innes, the philosophical historian, is supplied from those writings of his which were issued in the last six years of his life between 1947 and 1952. Here is exposed in piecemeal fashion a corpus of theory. Let us call this corpus the B series of his publications, or as some have said, the later Innes, in contrast to the preceding A, ser A series, <coughs> consisting of those economic studies published up to that time. Now, the fact that the B series was written at all raises an intriguing question. How do you get from A to B? Or better, how trace the intellectual path leading backwards from B to A? One preliminary observation is in order. It was the existence of the A series that granted professional legitimacy to the B series. Had Innes begun his career as a philosopher of history, somewhat in the Toynbee manner, rather than as an economist, would we hear much of him today? I doubt it. He was not a popular writer and never wanted to be. The learned community, on the other hand, has become increasingly distrustful of large ideas of that kind of enterprise which seeks the possible interconnections between things <coughs> rather than giving exclusive consideration to the things themselves. The age of specialization has placed comprehensive thought, which means speculative thought, at a disadvantage. Readers of the B series of Innes' writings might be puzzled or dubious. But the author of previous classic studies of Canadian staple production could not easily be brushed off, especially when his theory of the historical importance of communications technology was buttressed by such a lavish use of specific economic data. It was the Innes of the A series who was able to command an audience for the B series. Conspicuously in the case of the delivery of the Beath lectures at Oxford, on empire and communications. This was a work indeed with which reviewers had difficulty. In one respect, the bridge between A and B was easier for him to cross than it would have been for American colleagues because of the institutional character, one may guess, of his department, <clears throat> defined as a department of political economy not portioned out after the present American fashion into separate departments of economics and government. Within this intellectual ambience, derived, I conjecture, from British precedent, <clears throat> it was easier to accommodate the notion that economic history was a branch of political history, that economic systems represent political decisions. Whatever was it, within the realm of political economy, that steered Innes to explore with such concentration the techniques and effects of communication? A rather simple answer would lie in the subject matter of his A studies, namely Canada. Here is a country, if you forgive me at the moment describing it in these rather casual terms, uh, spliced together so to speak, its habitable portions lying within narrow latitudes, but extended lengthwise over very immense longitudes, these portions having local and competing interests within a national fabric which so often seems about to come apart at the seams. The Maritimes from Upper Canada, Quebec from Ontario, Central Canada from the West, and the West itself split by the Rocky Mountains dividing the wheat plains from British Columbia. But it has not come apart. In this, I think, so a country, a nation, in which he passionately, though secretly, believed, which owed its existence to the exploitation by varying techniques of the means of physical communication. The rivers, the lakes, the connecting canals, and then the railroads, the intercolonial, and the Canadian Pacific. 
He did not live to see the completion of that Canadian dream, the Trans-Canada Highway, nor uh, the complete mastery over Canadian time and space achieved by Air Canada. That is, when it is not on strike. <clears throat> it might be useful to remember that a prerequisite for the functioning of a federal legislature at Ottawa in those days was the granting of free railroad passes to its members. Innes indeed argued in economic terms for a natural system of exchange of goods and services along the east-west axis, as I have said, as against those who argued for a north-south orientation as the only natural one, which would mean economic integration with the United States. But, starting with this, one may still ask why, in his latter years, turn exclusively to that form of communication comprised in language. A word, by the way, which recurs and recurs in his theoretic writings. Even here, a linkage between A and B is discernible, an economic one. In two major works, he had covered two staples of the Canadian economy, furs and fish. At the time when he was writing those studies, one more staple product, this time a raw material processed by technology, was entering the market with great effect on Canada's economic relations. This was wood pulp processed to make the paper conspicuously consumed by the American and British press. In this, it is said, planned a study of this industry to complete his previous ones. But I suggest that he became fascinated and perhaps repelled by what the Canadian forests were being turned into. A new means of mass communication by language conspicuously lending itself to monopoly control. One might still ask why an economist turning his attention to the present effects of the pulp and paper industry should allow himself to become entangled in the problems of human communication in general on a historic scale, reaching back to antiquity, almost to the exclusion of all other matters. I detect here a strand connecting him with his native soil of Ontario. He grew up in a farming community. <clears throat> in which two facts of life as it was lived confronted the thoughtful youth, and Innes was very thoughtful. There was the use of that speech by which the land was managed on a day-to-day -day basis in terms of which daily life was conducted. Its idioms did not come from books, and thus the Bible and maybe Shakespeare. It was felt as an oral medium, its expressions often matching the rhythm of nature and the seasons but also indexing the specifics of existence and human behavior narrowly observed. His biographers recall his delight to the end of his life in the telling of stories orally invented, remembered, and transmitted. But suppose you wish to escape from the farm, go to the city, enter professional life. This meant study, the mastery of books, of the printed word in volume, of a sophisticated vocabulary and syntax, a genteel literacy suitable to an urbanized style. This was the second fact of life, and the two of them together constitu constituted the real dialectic of Innes. Starting from this, he could take off for an exploration of all the modes in which the bookish word had been incorporated and communicated but always with a lingering feeling that behind them all lurked a mode which was preliterate and maybe preferable. It is not a dialectic which European intellectuals, bred in highly literate cultures, would find easy to share. The thoughts of a thinker like Innes are self-motivated. They may owe a debt to the effects of early influences, but are not reducible to them. There is, however, one more dimension in his mind, which was fostered, one may guess, from native sources. Superficially, his preoccupations can be viewed as behavioristic, even though behaviorism is an intellectual position which he attacks. As he reviews the varieties of material means by which men communicate and the economic effects that various means produce, 
Communication itself becomes the God in the machine, the master of men, not their servant. But latent in this analysis, never far below the surface, one detects the recurrent and contrary notion or belief that it is not the technology but the content that is important. Communication is not a matter of mere gadgetry, nor on the other, <coughs> on the other hand is it an activity which is self-justifying, perused only for its own sake, with no end beyond that. Accepting the premise, as I think he does, that the nature of a given means affects the nature of what is communicated, the content still remains the fruit of human thought, which for Innes is the paramount reality. The importance of studying different technologies is that it reveals varying methods by which minds communicate with each other in the pursuit of given ends, some of which are more worthy than others. And the technologies of communication have some effect on the choices made. I'm aware that in so saying, I go beyond anything Innes explicitly says. But as one reads him, one senses a note of humanism, a sense of values, which to be sure he assumed could be compromised by technology, but which are not created by it. To that volume of collected papers, which appeared under the title The Bias of Communication, he appended a preface in which he said of these papers, in a sense, they are an attempt to answer an essay question in psychology, which the late James Ten Brock, professor of philosophy at McMaster University, was accustomed to sit. Why do we attend to the things to which we attend? They do not answer the question, but are reflections stimulated by a consideration of it. They emphasize the importance of communication in determining things to which we attend and suggest also that changes in communication will follow changes in the things to which we attend. You will notice that he says follow, not precede. When he wrote this, he was very likely sitting in his office in the old McMaster building, now the Department of Political Economy, recalling a memory of undergraduate days spent in that building in an institution with a religious bias, where it was taken for granted that a chief object of education was, was an exploration of the truths of the human condition. Innes's own professional preoccupations were secular. It can be supposed, however, that though he discarded or grew out of the theological affirmations to which in youth he had been exposed, he never discarded the feeling that man was a special being. And special because he had a mind which made political and economic choices, which were also moral choices. The instrument for doing this was language, man's cardinal activity. But language functions only as it, is, as it is communicated. How then is its communication managed? This becomes the cardinal question addressed to a cardinal activity. Certain influences flowed into him from other thinkers. These have been noted by scholars of his work. Veblen, I suspect, was pretty fundamental. He would have encountered his work at Chicago, if not before, perhaps adopting from him the view of the importance of marginal economic activity interacting with the center of production and power, which he applied in a dialectical formula. I'm not sure I'm right about that, by the way. I would like to correction from anybody who knows Veldin better than I do. The ancient Greeks, <coughs> marginally situated in relation to the Eastern empires, could in their situation become the source of new energies, which in their turn reacted on the center. I noticed this application of the center margin dialectic in his writing on Greece. Such formulas would be congenial to a Canadian citizen of the British Empire, marginal center. More conspicuously, his theory of a general dialectic between space and time, producing moments of equilibrium and peri periods of disruption, 
has obvious affinity with Hegel's dialectic, dialectic of history. It would be instructive to know what philosophy courses Innes took at McMaster. He cites Hegel both positively and negatively, to agree and to disagree. I think, however, that the attempt to forge a link between Innes and Marx must on the whole fail. The framework of Innes's dialectic is not furnished by conflict between classes with conflicting interests. The ownership he is interested in, so far as he is interested in ownership, is that exercised over the means of communication rather than production. His skeptical temper would also have rejected <coughs> the Marxist utopia of a classless society as naive and philosophically impossible since it presumes the end of the historical process. His intellectual roots grew in the Canadian soil out of a Canadian experience. They, of course, owe a debt to European nourishment, but in this connection, speaking myself as a classicist, I would venture to call attention to a certain educational advantage that he may have enjoyed in avoiding Oxford which several of his academic contemporaries attended as Rhodes Scholars, avoiding it in favor of Chicago. At Oxford 60 years ago, had he taken great, the present degree in philosophy, politics, and economics did not then exist, he would have been exposed to an intensely urbanized and urbane community, highly literate and conscious of the fact, and to an intellectual climate still pervaded by the philosophical assumptions of neo-idealism, as these had taken hold in the writings and teaching of Green, Bradley, and Bosanquet. Had he been introduced to classic Greece, he would have been required to view it in terms of the achievement of ideals, moral, political, and spiritual, certainly not in terms of technology, still less the technology of communication. The same idealistic bias informed the teaching of men like Maurice Hutton, an Oxford greats man who brought Plato, one may say, to Toronto. He was still both professor of Greek and principal of University College at the time when Innes was completing his degree at Chicago. The same could be said of E.J. Erwick, his own chief in the uh, department, in his own department, with whom he had frequent and sometimes bitter differences. <clears throat> when, therefore, in the mature years of his thinking, Innes turned to contemplate Hellas, he did not have to listen to these siren voices. He immediately grasped the oral situation in which the Hellenic experience had begun, and the vital importance of the intrusion of the alphabet, a new technology, into this situation. I quote, absorption of energies in mastering the technique of writing left little possibility of considering the implications of the technique. This kind of observation, as he made it, is, was not the fruit of a classical education. And I doubt whether it would occur to any members of a classics, de classics department to make it. But it does correspond, in a way, to the conditions of a North American education, whether you apply it to the youngster on the farm or the inhabitant of the present urban ghetto. To this attempt of mine, I hope not too presumptuous, to reconstruct Innes's intellectual journey, I add a postscript on the relationship between his investigations and my own. This is more slight than some may have supposed. In 1950, four years after I had left Toronto for Harvard, I published a study of the Prometheus Bound of Aeschylus, in which I interpreted the drama as symbolizing a conflict between the short-range intelligence exercised by men of power, represented by Zeus, the tyrannical overlord, and the long-range intelligence employed by the intellectual embodied in Prometheus, the forethinker, the word Prometheus so indicates. I applied the lessons to be learned from this to the conduct of the First World War and its aftermath. Innes must have read this soon after it appeared. Prefaced to the strategy of culture, those two essays which were published in the, year, in the year of his death, he added some brief remarks 
in which he reported my own argument in the following terms. Intellectual men, these two words figured in the title of my own book, <clears throat> of the 19th century was the first to estimate absolute nullity in time. The present, real, insistent, complex, and treated it as, in, as an independent system, the foreshortening of practical pre prevision in the field of human action has penetrated the most vulnerable areas of public policy. War has become a result and a cause of the limitations placed on the forethinker. Power and its assistant force, the natural enemies of intelligence, have become more serious since the mental processes activated in the pursuit and consolidating of power are essentially short range. This last clause is a quotation from myself, duly acknowledged. It was therefore Innes's perception of the present-mindedness present fostered by modern means of communication, which, <clears throat> and his increasing conviction that a healthy society should embody a kind of creative balance between intellectuals and those who govern it. It was this which established contact between us in the last months of his life. Studies of mine bearing on conditions of orality and literacy in antiquity had not appeared, and when they did many years later, they were written to tell the truth without reference to Innes's works. I recall having given one or two public lectures in Toronto University during the war years on the oral character of the Homeric epics and the society which produced them, and it is possible that Innes attended them. I'm not, I don't know that he did. I do know that other colleagues did. As I've remarked earlier, during these same years and just previously in the late, very late 30s, <clears throat> I, like Innes, was reading in um, Martin Nielsen's Homer and Mycenae <coughs> in Quanford's Religion from Religion to Philosophy and Thucydides' Myth Historicus in Rhys Carpenter's account of the invention of the Greek alphabet, and in Parry's analysis of the Homeric oral style. Innes had read all these. They all appear in his footnotes of this period. We therefore did have common scholastic guides in our reading. <clears throat> I would like to think that I had had a cozy seminar with him in which I had suggested all these to him, but I didn't. I suppose if I were asked to add any corrections of my own to Innes's work from my perspective, it would be to suggest that, Innes, that his moral preference for the oral word is colored by a certain romanticism which history fails to justify. It is all very well to stress the oral component in Greek culture, but after all, it was mainly the alphabet which released the energies of this culture into history, both for the Greeks and their successors. Without this technology, how much would the Romans, not to mention ourselves, have known of the Greek mind? The Romans had more of the physical monuments than we have, but would these have been enough? <clears throat> A second correction that I would offer is this. There is the communication which is spoken in converse, the truly oral word. But there is also the communication which is placed in storage so that it can be reused, consulted, and referred to. <clears throat> this can be done to a degree orally through the use of poetry. But script adds a new and a fantastic dimension to this capacity. And it is this kind of stored communication which becomes the support of advanced civilizations. So at least I have myself argued in my published works. The fact remains, however, that in reading Innes, I discover with relief that I have had company in what has been a rather lonely journey through those halls of learning which the classical scholar has made his own and where the atmosphere may verge on the pontifical. And it has been company provided from a rather unexpected source.
we would have shared counsel, and he would have helped me on my own road, if only he had been allowed to live the allotted span. As it is, support has been supplied from Marshall McLuhan, for whose generous acknowledgments of my own work I am grateful. The contiguity between Innes and myself seems therefore to have been, as much as anything, a matter of happy accident. The result, perhaps, of turning to similar sources at the same time with similar kinds of mind. However, possibly it was assisted also in my case by the character of my first contact with the Canadian scene, when I was still only 23, fresh from Britain, exposed to the realities of the educational process as it is conducted in a rural setting. The college which employed me, like McMaster, a Baptist institution, was surrounded by the apple orchards of the Annapolis Valley in Nova Scotia. And in August, one kept an eye on the weather. If there was a bad windstorm in that month, there would be fewer students enrolled from the valley in September. In Toronto, I continued to observe this dialectic between town and country, especially since so many students at Victoria came from rural settings. I think these impressions encouraged me in the formation of the view that ancient Greece must have had its own forms of educational enterprise conducted in conditions which, however remote, might bear some similarity. This would not have occurred to me had I stayed in urbanized England. And maybe I can claim some slight commu community here with Innes, even though he was a native Canadian, and I, of course, am not. Take him all in all, in the specific categories of his achievement, you will not, I think, find up to this point in time his equal among his fellow Canadians. A fatal illness of the body overcame him when his mind was still young, superactive in the formulation of a historical theory or set of theories which he did not live to complete. He had always re retained a surprisingly youthful appearance to match the mind within. His biographer records the memory, it is mine also, of that tragic change which overcame it in the latter days of his life. This had already occurred when I came, went back to Toronto to encounter him for the last time. I remember being slightly surprised, it was a few years since I had seen him, by a kind of nervous and suppressed energy which seemed to animate him. He seemed not so much to walk around the building as stride purposely, purposeful, purposefully through it. I speculate that he may have sensed already that not much time was left, and that he was determined to pack the maximum of thinking, reading, and writing into it, drawing on the resources of a disciplined will, assembling all those concepts, researches, and conclusions which constitute what has been called the third phase of his scholarly journey, putting down all he could, as quickly as he could, often in jumbled sequences which make hard reading. I hazard the opinion that his premature death constituted a minor disaster in the long history of the human understanding. Thank you.